and, and such to create better varieties. Part of the issues here, of course, are that there's a lot of disease issues um, that can't be dealt with with any kind of pesticide spray, such as viruses and things. Oh, I guess it's cooperating. Um, anyway, so I, I was asked to talk some about sustainability, and of course, living on an island, we're very aware of that issue because it's in front of us all the time. And this, this issue of having only two weeks' worth of food is really important. There's a couple of things, of course, that we can do is, is to have some emergency rations stashed away. And I lived in Florida for a while where the hurricanes come in and, and it was routine for people to have emergency supplies set up because you never know if you're going to get hit and, and have no access to food, water, or power for several weeks. Um, so for an emergency thing, you know, that's something we can do. The big issue with the food production is that we can grow some food here. There's a lot of things that will grow here. Uh, I have learned that the insects and diseases here are absolutely ferocious. Just ferocious. And I admire anyone who attempts to grow organically because the bugs, you know, they're going to win a lot of the time. <laughs> um, and even the traditional farmers who spray chemicals have a very difficult time controlling the population. Um, the issues on an island like this are really no different than the issues that everybody on the mainland is also going to face. Not so much right now, but in the future. Because all of these issues about sustainability, about productivity, uh, about pollution, about global warming, all of these really come down to issues of population increase because human populations have grown enormously over the past especially 200 years. And in the 1800s, there was only one billion people on the planet Earth. This year, we hit seven billion. And it's not going to go down. And so this magnifies all of the issues, um, you know, from water use and availability to growing our foods and how do we do that and where do we live and how do we move from one place to another and whether we're going to use cars and oil and all of these things. And so uh, during the next generation, we're going to see huge changes as people try to find solutions to this, these, these issues. We know that on an island like this, we can grow more food than we are. And really, part of the issue comes down to economics because it's very difficult to grow food here cheaper than it can be imported. And so the price of oil has been a major factor when there were dairies and cattle production here on the islands, those, those farms mostly closed because they could not compete with the cost of materials being shipped over from the mainland uh, with the, during the time of cheap oil. Now as the oil prices go up, the equation changes, and so now people are, are rethinking this and trying to think, well, what can we do? And for some things it will make sense, and for some products it, it won't make sense. Um, the islands are not big enough to grow enough feed for beef cattle to feed everybody on the islands. There's just not enough room, there's not enough water. And so that's not going to make sense. Um, so, you know, we need to look for alternative sources of protein or decide, you know, what beef is going to just be imported. Um, and, and pay the prices. For some of the fresh vegetables and things, there's a lot that can be grown here. Um, they don't require as much space as growing feed for animals. Um, some of the farmers, of course, are growing tomatoes, peppers, watermelons, onions, 
and things like that. Um, but these are mostly not the food staples, not like the wheat, rice, and, and things that are the, our stable carbohydrates. Um, we do have a little bit of taro production still up by uh, Wailua, where I live. Um, but most of the people on the island are not depending on that anymore. There is potential to grow a lot more, but it, whether we do or not depends mostly on economics. Um, it, it is difficult for far, small farmers to get access to land. If, if you have enough money to buy 150 acres or 200 acres, then it's, easy, it's possible to buy land. Um, I don't even know what the prices are, but I'm sure it's high. Um, but for for small farmers trying to get five acres it, it, or ten acres, it's really difficult. Um, so that that's an issue. I had a, a meeting last week with the uh, commissioner of agriculture, and and he says he's, that he's dedicated to uh, helping farmers, small farmers, getting started with loan programs and and things like that. There's some discussion about possibilities for. Get making some of the state lands available for small farmers and things like that. And we hope that those developments will come into being. Uh, right now, they're not there. I know that I have heard um, a lot of discussion about GMO crops. Um, I'm a geneticist. I've never actually worked with any GMO crops. I've never worked with any of the um, companies that develop them. Um, but I do understand the technology. I understand what's going on. I understand the chemistry. And I can tell you that there is an enormous amount of incorrect information that is floating around. There's a lot of fear because people don't understand the chemistry. And a lot of things that um, people express fears about are things that, in terms of the biology, are really not anything that's a big deal. As an example, I, I would like to mention that the Bt corn um, Bt refers to Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a natural bacteria. And Bt has been used by organic farmers to control caterpillars for many decades. And it's normally uh, mixes a powder and sprayed on the plants. And when the young caterpillars um, eat this material, uh, there's a protein in the bacteria that disrupts the digestive tract of the um, caterpillars and it kills them. And, and it's, a, it's mainly a protein that causes that. And the Bt corn is simply a corn that has the gene inserted that makes that one protein. So that when the caterpillars land, or the moths land on the corn and lay the eggs, when the eggs hatch and the tiny insect begins to feed, it's eating some of that protein and then dies. Where I lived in Florida, there was a lot of sweet corn produced in the winter. And by spraying the Bt on the corn, it would wash off every time it rained so that the corn had to be sprayed aerially every day. And with the GMO corn, it doesn't wash off. The protein is on the inside instead of the outside, and the caterpillars die, and they don't have to spray. What about human consumption? It, this particular protein has been proven to be safe for human consumption for more than four decades. It's been used by organic farmers for four decades. Wait. So it was okay decades ago to be used, sprayed aerially applied, applied mechanically or whatever, but then they started to grow the this protein through genetic modification. Has testing been done to show what the effects of are ingesting those proteins? 
and the other uh, aspects of uh, genetic modification are doing? Aren't we like essentially the test subjects here in the past decade or so? The, the chemistry is known what gene was inserted and what product it makes. And we know that that protein has been proven safe for human consumption. It's one of the safest things that, that has been used for any insect control. And that's why one of the reasons it was selected for that, for making that GMO. Um, you know, so I understand that people always want to ask questions, all right? But, you know, the reality is it, it's been used for a long, long time. And we know that there have not been health issues. A question. Are we not eating it in higher concentrations? When it was when it's sprayed on, first of all, it break down, breaks down in sunlight. Also, people tend to wash off the stuff, but if it's genetically in the food, it's not breaking down in the sun. You're not washing it off. Are you not consuming larger quantities of it, larger than people have? The question is, if, if the plant is producing the protein, does that mean that we're eating larger quantities of that? And I will say, the information is available, and I'm, I'm not aware of exactly what those concentrations are. Certainly, before the EPA uh, allowed, and FDA allowed, um, production of this, those questions were asked and answered by the, by the people who uh, were involved in the regulation. Yeah, question over here. I'm originally from the Midwest. Yeah, I, I lived in Michigan. It's really cold. You know, I, I grew up dreaming of surfing. And finally, I get to come here. Thank you. Okay, uh, my question is, do you understand that, do uh, you know actually what, is it on Agent Orange, the herbicide, yeah. 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 Have you researched that? I have not researched that specifically, you know what but I... Agent Orange, are the same component? Yeah, yeah. 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 so if you look into Agent Orange, how can you say you see uh, nothing wrong with the situation? No, I, I was not speaking about Agent Orange. I was speaking about BT corn. No, you were talking about GMO. The uh, Agent, Agent Orange is an herbicide, and when, when that was used in Vietnam, there was a contaminant called dioxin that was present during the manufacturing process. And it was the dioxin that has caused all of the health problems. And those were not anticipated. That was obviously a huge mistake. And, and our, 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 our American military really did a huge, created a huge problem for the world by their actions. Do you know that the U.S. was the ones that helped create this Agent Orange? and used it on over here first before we sent it over there. I, I was not aware of that. That's interesting to, to learn That's about. That's exactly yeah. where it came from, yeah. from the UH Manor, which is on so-called seeded land. So, you know, again, say you're not from here. Do you understand the history behind this park? Um, I'd, I'd be happy to talk to you about the history of the park. Does that relate to the sustainability, or can we talk about it in a minute? <laughs> we, can we come back to that? And another question. Another question in the back. As a geneticist, how do you feel about GMO uh, organisms uh, interbreeding with uh, non-GMO, like natural breeding uh, hybrids? The the question was how do, as a geneticist you know what's my opinion about GMO crops interbreeding with other other crops the the choice of materials 
use of crop Hello? Here we are. A number of people have... There. All right. Do I have a loose wire somewhere? Yes. Yes, do. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> At least that's... <up. laughs> um, in, in Hawaii... The main GMO crop that's grown is corn. Corn. All right. The right. corn producers maintain isolation so that they don't cross-pollinate with their other corn or with no. their competitors. No. Um, no. There is, I'm not aware of other people producing commercial corn here. Um, but corn pollen is wind-pollinated. So if someone is upwind, normally there's not going to be an issue. Um, with some crops, uh, such as soybeans, they self-pollinate. Cross-pollination is not an issue. Um, in, in general, for some of the other crops, like um, uh, rape, there was con concern for cross-pollination in Europe, and I, I don't know what the status of that is, whether that, that's has proved to be a problem. Question. Yeah. Waiting here. All right, so I'm from the Midwest, too. I'm from Cleveland. And if you actually knew how to farm, you wouldn't need genetically modified fucking farming. That's the lazy man way of saying I can't battle insects on my own. All right, dude, you take cayenne pepper, you mix it with some cinnamon, some ginseng, and some water, and you spray it on your foliage. I guarantee you get rid of 98% of anything that's going to take out your crop. And then, you buy 10,000 ladybugs. They're the bullies of the insect world. And you put them in the fridge, let them sit over during the daytime, and release them in your fields at night. They take care of the other 80% of the crops. Anything like mold, root rot related, you take super oxy, mix it to four parts water, feed it into your roots, and it cleans your roots and it stops mold from damaging, you know, future crops. Like, if you knew how to farm, you were amazed to have a genetically <laughs> modified thing anyway. Sir, how many, are, how many acres do you farm? Uh, my brother has a farm in California, 154 acres. How many acres, acres do you farm? Right now? Yes. Yeah. But for six <laughs> years, I farmed a 154 <laughs> acre pristine farm in Mendocino County with my older hippie vegan brother. All right. Full on grows, <laughs> no GMO products. With no bugs. No bugs. No Nothing. Game. Well, no you know, problem. That's, no caterpillars. That's great. No, none of that. You were talking about BT before and how the BT works and how and it, it, it does work really good. I use it myself. But, but kind of a, a tangent from what he's saying, if it does work so good, why do we need to do a lemon? Why do we need to replace it? If BT works, why not use it on the corn rather than putting it inside the pole? Putting it inside the pole. It, it, it really does work. Well, yeah. We've used it for and, what, 90 some years. And in some cases, it has to be applied every day, and that adds to cost. Well, cost. in truth, cost you want to break the, 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 the cycle of what you're packing for. It's not every single day. It's once you get hold of that cycle. Of, of whatever it is that's coming in. Once you've interrupted that cycle, you're not going to have to keep doing it every day. Granted, yeah, I mean, it breaks down within the 24 hours of sunlight. You're right, and the rain comes along and so on. But it's, it's kind of going with what he's saying. Isn't, isn't the, doing the genetic thing... I don't want to make this sound bad, but in a sort of a way, isn't it sort of lazy farming? Yeah. I like that. Yeah, I mean, because like we do have ways like BT that does work. More money for who? For the well, more money for who? you know, you well, should ask that question, question of the farmers. People. You should ask that question of the farmers because they're the people who are asking for these products. These are the people who buy these products, preferably over something else. Because, because they're happy to, yeah. because in the way that it works. It is the market. Well, there's a, another question in addition to how much work it is. It's a question of reliability, and farming is a very risky business.
and steps that can be made economically to reduce that risk are things that farmers pay a lot of attention to. But then it increases the risk to people's health. And so you need to look at people's health versus, you know, making it very available so that you increase the profit. So you have to look at and weigh it. The people's lives are more important over the profit. So maybe the farmers don't even know about it, okay? Like the common citizen. They don't even know how much uh, detrimental That's that right. is if you put this inside the pond, you know, for all these years and it's not being labeled. Right. Who knows what is inside us and get inside right. the bloodstream and causing a lot of these foreign diseases, okay? That's right. So that's the question. Always think of the person's health, the risk to the, the person's health. Right. We, we agree that our health is most important for all of us. And the people who work in the EPA and the FDA likewise believe that people's health is important. That's the problem. And That's the problem. That's the problem. Well, you may choose to believe or not believe, but I have worked with scientists and I understand their integrity. And, you know, there's a lot of people doing a lot of hard work to create food for everybody here. And it's food that is safe That's to eat, what it is. and you're really Thriller. not being poisoned. You're really not. Once you grow the seed, can you save the seed and replant it? The BT farm. Can you can you? The the farmers the farmers are not permitted to save uh, and replant seed that has been patented. Okay, now that's not the scientists that are deciding that. Right? No. No, those are the attorneys. I don't have a problem. No. <laughs> those are attorneys. That's where the problem is. Well, you know, we have a lot of problems that you know can be blamed on attorneys and, and, and people, attorneys who work in legislatures. Again, profit over the health and the livelihood of people. The reason why I bring up that part of it is because of what you said earlier about farmers want to do what's best for themselves. Okay, short term. They're going to say, hey, I don't have to spray the BT as often. I don't have to fight the, 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 the caterpillars and the, the, you know, whatever is going on. But long term, is it really helping them or is it hurting them? My understanding is that in India, where they grow a lot of cotton, where they have switched to genetically modified, where they cannot save the seeds, where they could not replant that kind of stuff, um, that yes, they can use less water, yes, they save money up front, yet suicides are an all-time high, That's failures right. are an all-time high. Right. Okay, short term, maybe it is beneficial, but long term, are there consequences? Now, I'm not saying it's because of scientists, but remember, the scientists, all they are doing is they're making it happen. It's someone else who's saying, hey, let's go one step further and let's you know, get yeah, older. So as long as perhaps if we had a little bit more of the scientists they could have a little more say over what lawyers need to do. But it's, it's I guess I'm a little bit concerned when when greed is the number one factor. The guys at the top are gonna tell the law lawyers you need to do it this way and they're gonna screw things up. In the meantime the scientists are over here and they're doing their thing and maybe they're doing Thing. Sometimes they are. I mean, look at the ring spot virus on the papaya. They save the, the papaya uh, uh, Hawaii industry. Okay, sometimes there's some good. Sometimes there's not. It's it cotton in India and so on. So, it's where do you draw the line? Yeah, where do you Again, draw the line? And, and also the FDA. How the much do you trust the, the FDA in, in our current the profit. system? You know, we have the best government money can buy. <laughs> really, really the FDA. I mean, I, I would be willing to bet that there is, not everything, but there is something that has slipped through the FDA because the right home is Absolutely. So, I, I, I'm not 100% I'm not against GMO. Well, you know, un unfortunately, I cannot speak for the integrity of bureaucrats. Okay. That's, that's where my concern is because you can't just look at the science side and, and Without just thinking, you know, forget about the look social at the whole issue, big picture. the ramifications, what the company is doing. I'm not, I'm not going to beat up on the scientists. 
scientists are looking at your right. BT works great. We've used it for 90 some years. I would like to see it continue. It's it qualified. It's got the little Henri sticker thing on the symbol on the thing. It's organic. It comes from the soil. It's perfectly normal. I mean, it's evolved to where it's at. Scientists looked at that and they said, hey, let's do it. Maybe it works. Yeah. <laughs> but what you just said, what the company is doing, remember, you can't save a percentage of your, your ears of corn and seed crop for the next go round. Farmer, no, farmers no, don't, no, say, no, none of the no, farmers no. save seed no. because if commercial it, corn it, is all hybrid. Saving seed, it wouldn't breed true anyway. The information, the anyway. The information is you have to share, sir. A lot of other people would like to yeah. listen. Okay, it's not being recorded. <coughs> but in other words, uh, you know, if you have something to say, let the rest of the people so they can understand. Please. No, don't be ashamed. Please step up. You see, this is where it starts, okay? You gotta talk, you know, you gotta talk when it's right. Um, I just want to remind everyone, um, as a part of the uh, organization of this panel discussion, this conference, whichever you want to call it, I, I invited these speakers um, to speak, you know, as, as um, their form of expertise, um, the fields that they specialize in, and basically this is a little piece of who they are. Um, I chose uh, some of these speakers because I knew that they had, you know, a, 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 a opposing um, um, fields and, and uh, opinions and perspectives. So I also, be so in doing that, I wanted to create a, a really diverse dialogue, something that's a little bit different from a panel discussion and a conference that I've, that I've always been to. Whereas the, the topic is, anything. it could be anything. It could be sustainability, and they're all like organic farmers. They're all like you know, or, or scientists and whatever, but they're all on the same side. And I never got to experience a panel discussion where some people were all, all on different sides, not, not, not so much that completely different end, end of the spectrum, in some case, there is. But the idea behind what I did today is to, is to open, open that dialogue between people who don't, um, who don't share the same perspective, who, are, who aren't like-minded, and for us to kind of listen to each other and look at how we interact with each other when we don't like what another person has to say, <laughs> when they are just another person. So, just remind ourselves a little bit about where we're coming from, what we're here for as individuals, as, as males, as females, as revolutionaries, as activists, but mostly um, um, as family. So, please mind your mana'o. <laughs> you know, really, all of us want a better world. You know, it, it's way too easy for all of us to point the finger at problems <coughs> and issues and sorry. All of us want a better life for our children, our grandchildren. And Somehow we've got to find ways to work together to make, make all of this world a better place. You know, he was bringing up on the seeds, and uh, here, like earlier, we found out we had days where we could the supply here on the side. Now, since we're not able to use the seeds, what happens when the boats stop coming to bring more seeds to and all this stuff that we need for uh, us to keep producing some form of food here on the island so we don't become cannibals like some of say, you know, earlier. Well, I, yeah, you know, are the boats going to stop? Uh, yeah, what, there's, what they, there's what various happen reasons if the, why. What the cause the boats to stop? We're, we are the most polluted spot in the world for a reason, because we're surrounded by water. Not everybody is able to take a kayak like, uh, uh, what is it, uh, Google Maps, yeah, like right, you say, right. across the ocean to get here. So, you know, with that, if uh, we have a major catastrophe between Big Island, uh, say something breaks off, or earthquake, a volcano, a tsunami, uh, many, many different things that could happen that would cause the boats to stop coming, what do we do when we look at our crops for food and we can't plant no more seed or produce the crops because we rely on Monsanto? Well, if, if, if there's a natural disaster, the boats, 
that stops the boats or a war or something, it would take too long to grow any crops to keep people. All right. So, you know, in a certain sense, you know, that, you know, almost, almost a good point if you're having to wait for crops to grow. Well, if we have on. to wait to even plant the crops, we're even worse than well, the to plant the right. crops themselves, right? Well, it doesn't, you know, The reason why I ask is because other nations have been crippled by the fact that they can't replant the crops right. and they're going bankrupt by buying the seeds. So if they if they if they destroy their economy and their crop stance on a crop that they can't reproduce on their own, how are those just like they see they can't feed themselves anymore and utilize those crops? How is a nation that's able to sit there and, and even attempt to sustain themselves if they're in the same predicament because of a natural disaster. <laughs> what country are you talking about? The you're standing in one. Well, <laughs> if, if we have to immediately start growing all of the food here for everyone who lives here now, I'm saying there is land, there are some tractors, but if the boats stop coming, the oil stops coming. And and without the oil, you're, you're not running the tractors either. Can I ask a question? The peak oil spill that was just being shown over this last weekend, and Roberto Perez Rivero, who is here from Cuba. Cuba is now the only country that is self-sustainable, apparently, at this time. And they experienced their peak oil crisis before the rest of us due to political situations. And, and, the, and they are now self The standard of living in Cuba is but really they have difficult. Life. You know, they're doing very well in Brazil by the same tenants. And I can't, I don't think that's true that the standard of living is well in Cuba. It's so, it's so if you like a lot of amenities, but right. they have a very rich cultural uh, life there. They have ballets and they operas and, you know, all the things that really make people human, a very rich artistic life, as well as everyone being fed. And people don't work themselves to death, and they have a very strong sense of community. They have what people in this country are working literally at the nine to five to try and achieve. We work really hard so we can have two weeks of relaxation at the end of the year. You know, we work really hard so we can rush home and maybe spend some time with our family. We farm our kids out to daycare because we have to work really hard so we can make a nice house for them so that they have a home to come home to after they've been in daycare for six hours a day. I mean, they, that Cuba inadvertently has, has circumvented all of those problems. And really, when it comes to this business of saving seeds, I mean, that is so, so important because um, we need, uh, there are many groups on this island now that are trying to get Hawaii to move so towards sustainability before the barges stop coming, before the planes stop coming, because it can happen. You know, you really need more imagination. No one thought that the Twin Towers would come down with two big planes. I'm you know? sorry. I, I really apologize. You see, again, I'm saying you have a lot of valuable information. He has a mic. You don't have anything. Nobody can understand what you're saying. We should pass the mic. No, we no. need a facilitator. We need to facilitate. <laughs> sorry. Well, here I am. I'm here to represent. I'm here with a mic. Yay. All right. Well, um, you know, so uh, I really mind my teeth. Excuse me. All right. Um, so as I was saying earlier, I mean, uh, we had a wonderful example that came to this island um, to this last weekend and a couple of weeks prior to you. A man named Roberto Perez Rivero was here, and he was um, here visiting from his country of Cuba, where um, that country has. Uh, achieve sustainability. Oh, sorry. Oh, I, yeah, I have to keep it in front of my mouth too, don't I? Um, and uh, you know, they survived their peak oil crisis. Their peak oil crisis was brought upon them because of political circumstances that um, stopped their copious oil flow. So you know, they probably didn't think that was going to happen to them. In a very short period of time, they didn't have what they were supposed to have. And there's this wonderful film called The Power of Community which you can find online, which is a very, very, very good um, uh, history and detailed explanation of the changes that had to be made. But aside from that, so it could happen, 
we need to think forward. And the thing is, is we have these countries, we have Cuba and probably other countries as well, that um, can serve as an example of what we need to think of. But as I was saying earlier, I hate to bring up the tragedy of 9-11, but people couldn't imagine that one either. I mean, there are, we are living in a really interesting time. There are things that can happen that we couldn't imagine. And a lot of people can really foresee that we very well could be short of food, especially here in Hawaii, where we're so surrounded by water and we're so, so dependent, like what, 95% dependent on stuff that comes in, on the plane and the barges. And here we are, an island nation with wonderful weather, really great soil, you know, enough water. All we lack is planning. We don't have a good plan. We really need to move towards possibilities of being self-sufficient. And there are a lot of organizations on this island that are working towards that. Because you can see a little bit down the road where this might kind of be necessary. And we do need diversity of, of crops. And we do need diversity of seed. And we need crops that reproduce their seed because that is the most effective way to, uh, to sustain diversity in our food crop and also just to sustain our food crop. I mean, it's been, it's, there are lots of studies, you know, in National Geographic and magazines like that, where we used to have, like, what? I don't know, 100 different kinds of corn, and now we're down to, like, five, and half of which are GMO. You know, we used to have, like, hundreds of different kinds of apples, and now we're down to, like, 10, things like that. I mean, that really is not sustainable, aside from the fact that we're losing all this biodiversity. So, you know, we know, you know we're losing the biodiversity in terms of our flora and fauna, because, like, Hawaii is one of those places where 80% of the natural animals that lived here aren't here anymore. So we're losing it in terms of our crops too, and not just here, but nationally. And it can't be good. There's no way that that can be good. We are really, we built a house of cards that was based on money. And that's how it ties into Occupy. Everything ties into Occupy right now. So the, the house of cards is falling down. And it's, it's, you know, our economic system is crashing as we speak, and everything else is tied to it. We need a crop vision, a vision of growing food that is sustainable, that is based on the needs of the people who are going to eat the food. Thank you. Good one. Um, I'm Henry Curtis. I got my start in the environmental movement. We're going to hold up uh, until the sirens stop. I'm Henry Curtis. Um, I got my start in the environmental movement going door to door in California in the 1980s. My chief I issue that I worked on was pesticides. I know, for example, that methyl isocyanate, MIC, was what leaked at Bhopal, India, the worst disaster for pesticides in the world history. That is a precursor to making aldicarb, a pesticide sprayed in granular form on soil that is sucked down, brought up into the roots, inside potatoes, so when bugs land on them and drink them, they kill over dead. It's a dirty dozen pesticides. I also worked on changing the laws in this state because this state says if you try to use genetically engineered techniques in your living room with the windows open and you attempt to make a bubonic plague that is legal. I repeat, it's legal. It's illegal to ship it in from California to here, but it's legal to try to splice it in your living room with the windows open. And I was told at, at the legislature, the reason we can't legislate any restrictions like that is because if you put a single restriction on genetic engineering, that is a slippery slope, and soon you'll want to regulate the industry. Yeah. And therefore, it's better not to have any regulations, whatever, because after all, what can possibly go wrong? We've seen the meltdown at Wall Street. Could that happen with our crops? Who knows? Who cares? That was the opinion of the legislature. As to whether we can grow our own crops here, during the American Civil War, we grew potatoes, we grew wheat, we sold it to California because they were cut off from others. What's preventing us from becoming sustainable here is that the land, agricultural land, is cheap. Developers know if they claim they can't grow anything on it, then they can turn it into a tourism or a residential development. They're allowed to put gentlemen estates up with housing and not use ag land for agriculture. And 
85% of the dollar value of all crops produced in this state, 85% is exported. We are growing the wrong crops, and the number one crop that we're growing that's wrong are seeds, which are being exported. Thank you. Um, this is a talk and not a debate, just so everyone knows. Discussion. Discussion is at the end, so can Dr. Scott finish? Is that okay with everybody? Yeah. Is everyone okay with letting other people speak? Well, we, I think it would be just as well to start your discussion now. You want to start it now? Yeah, why not? Go team, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's, set, let's get set up so and everyone can just mingle around for a few minutes. Okay, we'll be back in oh, a yeah. sec. Oh yeah, Henry Curry. Holy shit. Holy shit. You said shit live. Um, no, <laughs> <laughs> um, Hi, I'm Henry Curtis. I'm back again. I was going to talk about energy. And anybody here have an extra half billion dollars? <laughs> yeah, I got bailed out. <laughs> Lanai has just been sold. Oh. What? Lanai. Lanai, the island of Lanai has just been what? sold. I just... Half a billion dollars. The third wealthiest person in the world has bought it. Who is that? He has $36 billion. So a half a billion is not much for him. So that's the, what, the top one-tenth of one-tenth of one-hundredth, one-thousandth percent, number three in the world. Um, I'm talking about energy here. Um, and I thought since we're talking about energy and sustainability, the curious thing is that the Hawaiians had no word for sustainability. Okay. If you go to the Hawaiian dictionary and you put in the word sustainability, you get zero hits. They knew what it was. They lived within their means. We had a million people here. They had enough food to live on. We now have a million people, and we import 90%. There's something wrong. And yet, if you look at what sustainability is on the web, you just put in sustainability, you get 125 million hits. Um, and, and it's curious what you get, because you get sustainable growth. Doesn't work. but. Um, Sustainable is really a buzzword. I don't like it. I don't like green. I don't like renewable. I don't like sustainable. I don't like clean. I don't like smart. They've all been corrupted. So when I talk about energy, I like low climate impact, low environmental impact, low cultural impact, relatively cheap energy from here. And that's pretty hard to screw up. I read recent, recently there has been a lot of talk by the American Wind Energy Association about how they want to renew the federal production tax credit to sort of subsidize big wind so we can have more large industrial size uh, wind farms. And so I, today I just went to the web and decided to look up the board members of the American Wind Energy Association to figure out who is sitting on the National Wind Board that wants all these windmills. And there are 29 people. There's one person from BP. There's one person from GE. You know, the guys who put PCBs in the Hudson River for three decades and then complained for 25 years that they would actually have to be responsible for it. There are five companies that are involved in nuclear energy. Exelon has one-fifth of the nuclear capacity in the United States, and they sit on the American Wind Energy Association board. There are actually seven wind companies out of the 29 board members. Because wind energy, big, giant, industrial-scale wind, is a profit motive for giant corporations 
that don't really care about sustainability, don't really care about the future of the planet, or simply after their next bottom line. Whether they can make money in the next quarter or the next half year and not about the long-term survivability of the planet. The solution on energy is actually to force a reversal. Right now we all have smart cell phones. What is a smart cell phone? It's a phone without a wire. So how come a smart grid is building wires all over the place for the electric grid? Hmm. The smart way of the future is to have a lot of energy efficiency, to open all those windows up there, because, heck, they have lights on during the day when there's sun coming in. They have windows that don't open. Then they need air conditioners to feel comfortable. And that's all taking fossil fuel. The trick is open the windows, use less lights, and put more solar panels on the roof. I was up on the parking lot. I go up on parking lots a lot to the upper floors of the parking lot, for example, at the Dole Cannery at Evelé, to, to look out at the building, the rooftops. And you see the new Home Depot that has just been installed, built there, not a single solar panel on it. The Lowe's, not a single solar panel. We have amazing rooftops. And a number of years ago, I approached Hawaiian Electric and said, why don't we look at how much solar can go on rooftops? And they said, oh, you know, in order to put on solar, you need vacant land. And we don't have enough vacant land, therefore we just can't do it. And I kept saying, no, you really got to look at your own rooftop. So finally they said, okay, we'll look at our rooftop. So they went with Hoku Solar. You know, the company that took 221 funds from us, and split to Idaho. Idaho. Um, they used our tax money to become an entity. They moved to Idaho. Um, Pico went with Hoku to put solar on the roof. And they thought about it for like three years and finally came back and said they couldn't finance it. Couldn't finance it. The utility gets 99% of its own generators are powered by fossil fuel. A few years ago, they talked about how palm oil would be the savior for them. You just go to the tropical rainforest like the Amazon, Borneo, chop down the rainforest, yeah, good, grow right. plantations with palm oil, right. bring it here, burn it in the refineries, put it in the power plants, and then we'd be sustainable because the planet might not be doing good, but their bottom line would be doing great. Right. Right. Point Electric... Um, has a great racket going. They make a lot of money for themselves. And so I decided that it was it was silly waiting for them to wake up and see see the light. Because the bottom line is you can always the fossil fuel industry is a three trillion dollar a year industry. Three trillion dollars. The largest oil companies make a hundred million dollars a day in profit. A hundred million in profit. They can afford to take a little bit of that money and buy scientists. Good intentioned scientists, good intentioned politicians, good intentioned PR firms can spin how there's just no solutions out there. So I wrote a book, a book 150 pages, uh, Wayfinding, Navigating Hawaii's Energy Future. It's now available on the web. Um, www.lifeoflandhawaii.org. The approach is first to move away from central fossil fuel generation as much as possible to rely on renewable energy here on the islands. Hawaii can, over the next 10 to 20 years, become 90% of our energy from distributed renewable energy. And we should be moving towards a system 
so that in 20 or 25 years, all of our energy is produced on rooftops and we will no longer need the grid. We can dismantle all these power lines that are going up and down the streets and we can rely on on-site generation. This approach terrifies the utility, but in their annual filing with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, they actually put in their annual report that this is a possibility because they're required to disclose that this, this is a possibility coming. We need to push it a little bit faster. Hawaii has the highest electrical rates in the nation. We've had the highest rates for 20 years. The utility brags that they have above average income, above average profit, and they pay their executives very, very well. We have all kinds of renewable energy here. We have great people who have come up with a number of solutions. We just have to implement them. So now I'm going to violate the principles and ask, que ask people to ask questions. Anybody have any questions? I, I have a question. You've got to speak into the mic. You've got to come okay. up here, look at the I'm camera, and speak into I'm the sorry, mic. sorry, I'm kind of live streaming at the same time. I, I ha I'm, uh, I'm unclear about uh, geothermal on the Big Island because before I was uh, against it and then it fired up again. But then uh, Mililani Trask is for it, so I don't know, is it a good thing, is it a bad thing, both in terms of the environment and in terms of uh, ownership of the, um, you know, the, the utility itself. Geothermal had a curious history.